But Anton Chekhov is, uh, I think, um, the towering literary figure of the of, of late modernity. And what I mean by that is, is that what he actually is able to do is to force us to wrestle, wrestle with inescapable disillusionment, disappointment, disheartenment, and yet still be able to, like Coltrane, compassionately endure, to look the nullity of who and what we are, to look the absurdity of, of so much of our history, and still sustain ourselves as struggling, shuddering, suffering agents in the world. That I have been able to make enough money to support my loved ones, my wife and son, uh, and do, of course, anything for mom. I take a bullet for my mother. Uh, and, and, and family, too. You're absolutely right. In fact, I have been uh, privileged in an excessive manner. But at the same time, I've had to deal with the cost. You see, I had to deal with the cost because, you know, one of the most dangerous persons in the world is a self-loving, self-respecting black man who tells the truth about America. You see, so you got the death threats every day. You got... You've had death threats? Oh, Lord, all the time. From, you all know the where they're coming from? Well, they come from a variety of different sources and, you know, people keep track of them all the time. Are they all see. white people? Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. It's a small slice of white supremacist folk out there who's out of control, you know. But there's a cost that you have to pay. There's no doubt about that. Now, would I rather be broke as the Ten Commandments and pay the cost? No. I'd rather have, have some resources and money. But is it uh, uh, seductive to have too much money? Absolutely right. That's why you have to use it in the right way, you see. I first read Chekhov when I was 19 years old, and I could see he had a blue sensibility. How do you keep keeping on with love and compassion, with some sense of justice toward all, but you're wrestling with levels of disappointment and disillusion that will never let you go? What I really want to do is to, on the one hand, I want to lay bare the rich depths of the souls of American peoples in general and black peoples in particular in regard to our contribution to world civilization. Uh, how we wrestle with the sense of the tragic and the comic, what is distinctive about our democratic sensibilities, why are we the most market driven and the most religiously saturated of peoples as Americans vis-a-vis -vis other peoples. And I, we have to do that in a comparative way. That's why I go to the Russians, because the Russians have the richest, deepest, most profound literary tradition of the modern world. Have you been there? You see. Never been to Russia. Been there spiritually, intellectually, but never been there physically. Never been there physically. They, they have a, a thickness that, that we don't have in America. We, we, American culture is one much newer, of course. You know, it's just been around since 1776 in terms of the nation state. And we have a flow of immigrants who are Americanized, but bring with them very rich baggage, but at the same time have to learn how to adjust and adapt to the new American ways. And as Eugene O'Neill, our greatest playwright, pointed out, that we tend to be a people who think we can possess our souls by possessing commodities rather than digging deep in our souls. This is why the blues and jazz is so very important, you see, because it's one of the few examples in American civilization where it doesn't believe the hype about the melodramatic, sentimental stories of the happy ending, nor is it cynical. It tries to tell the truth about America, but also sustain the possibility of America. In, in the 60s, yeah. the music was there, uh, and uh, it, it, it was a revolution, wasn't it? I mean, you, you talk about no, the uh, well, students' revolution, and uh, the music, that was sort of, you know, that had it all, didn't it? It's an exaggeration. I think that's, that's been rom romanticized quite a bit. There was a lot of revolutionary rhetoric, but there were, never was a revolution. You mean, by I mean, and large? By and large, there was nothing that even resembled a revolution. There's a lot of people talking about it. No, but and they like to get together in large numbers and hold signs and march around and talk about it. And then after the demonstration, they would either be beaten up and have to <coughs> get the blood off their head, or they'd get a blowjob from a girl in a smelly blanket. Yes, but it changed people, didn't it? I mean, people are different now than they were 20 years ago. Um, yeah, people are different now than they were 20 years ago, but not necessarily better. A lot of the people who were out there doing those um, marches turned into yuppies. 
and I don't think that the world is better off because they exist. But, you know, I'm beginning to sound like I have a gripe. Maybe maybe somewhere deep inside me, I, I did resent a little bit the, the fact that, you know, that terrific phenomena of rock in the 60s pushed jazz into a corner because uh, I don't want to be controversial. I don't want to get into controversies, but I really don't. It, it doesn't matter to me. I'm where I'm at. They're where they're at. Let's all be happy, you know? And all I ever say about anybody is whatever you do, you got to live with it, you know? And, you know, if you're in it for a buck, that's fine as long as you know it. You know, if you're in it for, your, you know, soul food, uh, food for your soul or spirit, you know, that's great too, or both, whatever. Whatever it is, you have to live with it, you know. And uh, and I'm happy to live with, you know, with what I'm doing, and uh, and somebody else probably hates it. So, you know, that's that's all I can say, really. Is that what separates jazz from rock finally, other than musical considerations, is that jazz is for the music and rock is for maybe money and music? I really don't know. I, I, I guess you'd have to do a survey of rock musicians and ask them what their motivations are if you could get honest answers, you know. Uh, I think a lot of them would admit they want fame, popularity, girls, whatever, you know. Uh, and I'm sure that those things all play some part in, in any person who's a professional, a professionally ambitious in, you know, in any field of music. But uh, where those things line up numerically as far as priorities uh, might vary a little bit. Would you characterize yourself as somebody who was very angry before you went to prison? Nah, I thought I was charming. I just, then why were you always getting in all these altercations? I mean, something was going on. I have spirit. Spirit. I have so much spirit, man, where no one else would do things, I would do it. Well, a lot of people have spirit, but they don't... Because they're smart and they're mature, and I was immature before. I see. So my spirit was very, was handled in an immature manner. I just let it run. Now I'm, I'm a little bit more mature, and I'm going to get even more mature with time. So now I'm more mature, I can go... I know I want to do that. This is what I would do, but how, I ain't gonna do it. How would you characterize yourself as? How would you characterize yourself in the past? What does immature mean to I you? I was immature. Immature. I, I did things without thinking. My actions came before thought. And sometimes maybe words too. And all my words came before <laughs> thought. Things that I did, things I said. There's so many things I want to take back. Um, like what? Little. Th it's gone now, so I can't take it back. But um, I wish I could have, but I can't now. But um, because you are sort of known for having a big mouth. Yeah. No offense. I am no, and I don't mind either. I, and I don't, I don't. I know people feel like that, but I don't care. You know what I mean? This, this is how I feel. And then I'm in the business, right? So I hate hearing pe other people's thoughts. Like I'll be watching something, and I'll be like, "What a he's lying. He know he doesn't feel like that." So that made me go out when I finally got my shot to go on the camera. It made me go out there and say everything I really wanted to say instead of being like politically correct or thinking about how this would hurt people or thinking about how this would come out. I just want to say things just because I knew no one says that. Well, I can understand why a lot of people say they don't like jazz because right now, sometimes you say the word jazz and people think of some of the worst music on earth, like for instance, Kenny G. I mean, you know, there's nothing more stupid than that. Let's face it. That's the dumbest music there ever could possibly be in the history of human beings. There could never be music any worse than that. And now people think that that's what jazz is. Well, that's not what jazz is at all. Jazz is, at its best, the most incredible music. It's just that, like in rock and roll, 95% of it really sucks. It's just the really good stuff that's really great. And that's exactly the same in pop music. It's just like that in jazz. It's just that it takes a little bit longer to discover the good stuff in jazz because you go into the record store and there's so many records there you don't even know where to begin. It's good to find somebody to help you to learn about jazz, somebody who knows about it. Um, can you give me a mood light or something, you know, the, <laughs> as though I was actually a musician? And try not to laugh when I play this, because uh, I take it very seriously. The blue spotlight would be nice. <laughs> it's only the first line. waiting for the obligato. <laughs>
response to people who imagine that we live in a meritocracy, or worse still, who believe that meritocracy actually exists, that we can rank human beings a little bit like we rank potatoes, grade A, grade B, grade C, and therefore know which is the better potato and which isn't, which is the better person and which isn't, and therefore we can give through the better person the better reward, and it's all fairsies, squaresies, as if we were playing some sort of game. But we aren't, and capitalism may want to rank you, but you are an individual. You have unique talents, skills, passions, interests, and not only are you different from other people in that way, but those differences change over time. You de define new passions. You develop new interests, new skills. Either the system deals with that or it doesn't. Here's what a healthy economic system would do. It would spend a lot of time, it's called education, finding and nurturing those parts of you that are passionate, that are open to learning, that are interested in mastering certain skills, certain aptitudes, and so on. And then it would intelligently match those things that are strong in you with what the society needs. Why? Because that will get for the whole community the best out of you. And it will give each of us the satisfaction of knowing that we're making an important contribution with something that also excites and pleases and moves us individually. That would be best. We don't do that. We don't spend the time or the energy. We don't provide the funds to our schools to find in each individual the capabilities they have, to develop those capabilities, to give them the ability to change and adjust as their passions and their age and their experience lead them in new directions. We don't do that. Instead, we take a cheap shorthand. We say to a student, quickly, do some things. Here they are, an exam, a paper, whatever, and now we're going to give you an A or a B or a C minus or whatever. It doesn't reflect you because you are a complicated reality that has to be evaluated over time with lots of exposure, with different people participating, so it isn't one person's decision. What we have are schools that make each student try to please the teacher because that's how you get the good grade. To please whatever the test is, to do best on that so you can get the good grade, which gets you to the next level, and so you can get the good grade there. We teach to the grades, we learn to the grades, and we produce people who have good grades but may not know anything. Einstein got bad grades in math and physics. What happened? He didn't conform to what the teachers of his time wanted. Had they spent the time, they would have discovered the genius in him. There is genius in all of us. It's only a question of whether we have the nurturance, the time, and the support to do it. We don't. That's a tragedy of the American economic system and of its education system. But then the question arises, if that's true, if our individuality is systematically squelched by being ordered in a rank A, B, C, D, well then why does that persist, especially in a country that pretends at least that it's committed to the individual, to the unique differences we all have, etc., etc.? Why rank people as though they were potatoes? Answer, it serves a useful political function. And that's the important thing about meritocracy and its 
insistence that it be used in our system. Here's how it works. When you are fired from your job, or when you find yourself in a job that is boring, repetitive, oppressive, it never changes, it doesn't give you the satisfactions or rewards you think you're entitled to, and that your creativity could and would blossom if given the chance. We don't do that for most people. We fire them whenever the employer thinks it's profitable to do so, and we stick the vast majority of us in jobs we often hate. And when we wonder to ourselves, why? Here's where meritocracy enters. It's all your fault. You see, you don't have enough merit. Don't get angry at the system for not having developed your skills, your genius, your creativity. Don't get angry at the system for sticking you in a job where you can't show them. You can't contribute. You can't give all that you have. Don't blame the system for providing you with no job at all or the choice between no job and an awful job. No, 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 no. Blame yourself. You see, you don't have enough merit. You didn't get the right grades. You didn't go to the right school. You didn't You get the picture. It's a way the system has for failing the people in it and then blaming the victims of a failed system. Blaming the victim, it's always an awful spectacle in our society, and it deserves to be called out for what it is. At the age of 12, you were playing in a library, weren't you? In a music library. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was my first recital. And something happened. Some, somebody said something to your parents. To the, yeah, they, they put they them say? in the back of the, of the room to watch me, and I got up bravely. I was only 12. And I said, if my parents don't sit in the front seat, I don't play. And they were put there because they were That's black. That's right. How did that make you feel? It was my first encounter with racism. When you left America in 1972, you left because you couldn't racism. stand it. Racism. Just that. Racism. You couldn't stand it any longer. I couldn't stand it. Walking down the street. can't stand it. Crossing the street. <coughs> You get racism crossing the street. You get it in every, it's in the very fabric of American society. You can't stand to go to America? No, I can't. I went this year for the first time, right? Two times, and I, I worked at, at Newark New Stadium and Seattle. And they were so happy and surprised to see me because they hadn't seen me in how many years, Clifton? in seven years. But you didn't feel well treated? This time? Yes. This time they were more than happy to see me. They hadn't seen me so long they thought I was dead. But you wouldn't go back and live there? No way. And you keep telling them that? No way am I going to ever go back there and live. And I'm not the only one. Josephine Baker went back twice. And uh, she, after a second time she never went back. I met Cannonball, though, with Rusty Bryant in New York City on the corner, standing at 52nd and Broadway. That's where we met. And Cannonball had just come up. Um, he was with John Levy. John Levy, I knew the name. If you were in this business, you knew who John Levy was. John Levy was the former bass player with George Hearing, mm -hmm. who became George's um, road manager, eventually his manager. And because he did such a good job for George, and that just opened the door, by the time I went with John, he had Ramsey Lewis, Gene Harris, the three sounds, he had Cannonball, he, I mean, wow. uh, he had so many wonderful artists that he nurtured and, and made sure that they took care of the business and, and did wonderful things for them. So the object of my strategy was, uh, if I'm going to do this, the only person who I would trust to help and be there for me would be John Lee. What a rare commodity to have a, a musician, a fine yes, musician, yes. who would step into that role. And, that you, you know, knew I would care about him. you as a person, as yeah. opposed to being in sh the show business mm -hmm. uh, mode. I did not have this great desire to be in <laughs> show business, so I really needed to know that there was somebody out there who yeah. would allow me to be a person uh -huh. and, and to use the music to, to enhance, but 
be a part of as opposed to just overshadow everything else. And yeah. John understood that. Mm -hmm. I've been asked, you know, people, you've had to do this, you've had to do, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> I've, I haven't had to do anything. Yeah. I, I did not come up in an era where, like today, uh, young people really allow themselves, they believe that in order to make it, some do, uh, I will do whatever you say. And they are molding people, they're engineering the rec records, they're not, use, it's not creative anymore. It is being done over there with these little knobs. Mm -hmm. um, Art, if when you realize you reached a point where major million multiple sellers of records cannot perform the material in person, there is something very wrong with that. Yeah. Very wrong. I was really fortunate, as I say, I researched this quite well. When you, when you surround yourself with people like a David Cavanaugh and a John Levy, you do it with that in mind, that these people seem to care. And I don't... I never had anybody ever say, you got to do this. You have to, and I, you know, in the early days, you drank at the bar. No, I, no, I didn't do that. So I was fed stories, horror stories of show business. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. I said, well, I don't, I'm not doing that. Because that has nothing whatsoever to do with me being a singer. If it has to do with my music or me on stage or my performance, then we'll talk. But if it has nothing to do with that, you, we, but, no. Well, it sounds like your your musical and career instincts were really well formed in in your youth. Right. So that served you well. I brought it with me. When someone would attempt to tell you. In well, a, it, I I just felt that there has to be another way to do show business. I mean, if you're going to do it, I I want to sing. I don't want to be in show business. <laughs> so I've always made that distinction. Mm -hmm. There is a difference, and you can do it both ways. You can either be caught up in it and become totally involved and allow it to be the master. Or you can say, this is me. Mm -hmm. I have to do it this way in order to maintain, to be sane, to be myself. And I preferred, I chose to be me rather than to be somebody else. One of the best keyboard players, a magnificent conductor, as comfortable with the trio as he is with the symphony orchestra, and told me, frankly, although we tried to get him for some time, that until he felt that he could accompany me, as well as Jimmy Jones, oh. you know, he, he loved what Jimmy did for me. Mm -hmm. That he, and he just said, I'm not ready. I don't think I'll, and, but he's now with me for the almost 10 years, so. But that's the kind of feeling you want from your musicians. Sure. That, we are like a glove on a hand, you know. Yeah. It's nice to know that he, that he approached the I, work I with such commitment. Right? Yeah. That was unheard of. I mean, it was like, yeah. I, I beg you, what did you say? <laughs> I don't know if I can accompany you as well yet. And he worked at it being, because it, it, it is a different thing being an accompanist as opposed to playing piano. It sure is. I've had many pianists. Don Trenner was an accompanist, as was Ron L. Bright uh, and Lou. Many of the other people that have played for me, I would not have used the word accompanist. They are wonderful pianists and play mm -hmm. great keyboard. But accompanying is a special art. Yeah. And Lou Matthews has it. Yeah. I think it probably has a little bit to do with ego and looking at the total no, picture. It's, listening. it's ears. It's ears. It's it's a lot, you know, it's it's just realizing piano players play piano. Accompanists listen to singers. <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference, yeah. I'll tell you there's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Well now, uh, when you when you mention people like Ethel Barrymore or Tallulah Bankhead, is it the fact that you are performers? The three of you, is that what you have in common? Or do you there feel that there's been... There are there, actresses, artists. I look at them like, ooh. <laughs> and you don't consider yourself in the same room? No, my God, no. <laughs> why not? Now, why not? You, you've worked as hard, you've thought as much about it, you have developed a style, a technique, just as much as they have done. You please just as many people. So what in the world, why don't you feel that you have the same quality? Why are you not just as much an artiste as any one of them? Well, maybe I am in my little way, but my Lord, they, they make me cry. They make me happy. I don't know if I've ever done that to people, I really. Oh, I think you do. <laughs> I think you do know that. Yeah, I do. Uh, people talk about, you know, Charlie Parker Bird in, in, a, in an almost mythical sense, as if he were extra human, uh, as if he uh, had creative powers that were just uh, so far above other musicians that it would be unfair to even compare other musicians to him. Do you feel that way? Yes, I do. And well, especially in a musical sense. In a musical sense, Charlie Parker was such a perfectionist in terms of what he did. 
and how he did it, that there's no one that even came close to him in terms of emulation. I always use an example. One of the closest, uh, unfortunately, another gentleman that passed away, he lived down here also, Sonny Stitt, mm -hmm. who I got, I got to be very close friends with throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Well, he was from Saginaw anyway, and I was from Detroit, so, you know, we'd always meet those musicians that come to Detroit, because they would have to come to Detroit, Before actually, the, to find a job, or actually to find work. Because mm -hmm. if you lived in a town that's smaller than Saginaw, then it's very difficult finding a job as a musician. And most of those musicians would always migrate to the bigger, to the larger cities. In this case, uh, Detroit, where I came from. And this is how I got to meet Sonny and many, many more of the other great artists who became real great in their own right and artists in the business. As you said, that, that Stitt was the, was the closest thing to Parker, but even he was uh, uh, not in Parker's league. No. Uh, well, not from the standpoint of, of being that close to him as a perfectionist, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I still admire him greatly as a musician, and he still was among the innovators as so many others. But again, going back to Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker just had a quality and a charisma which just stood out so far above the others. This is what made I think his influence rub off on all other great musicians. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about other musicians who were considered equally as great, such as Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, uh, Don Byers, Ben Webster, Dizzy Gillespie, Fats Navarro, Clifford Brown. I could go on and on mm -hmm. to a, with a list that actually would never end mm -hmm. of musicians who got to be great in their own right. But still, even these musicians looked up to Charlie Parker, I think, more so than any other musician that you looked up to. At the time that you were uh, making it, making these th this music, and of course there was Dizzy's small group, and then you also participated in, in Dizzy's Dizzy's big bands, I guess through 1949 and in, even some into the 50s. How conscious were you that you were reshaping not only the face of jazz but the face of 20th century music? That oh, uh, I was quite aware of it. In fact, I was very aware of it uh, because I said, like most all musicians at that time were follow, were try, following in the footsteps. Uh, when I say that, I mean in terms of emulation and imitation. Followed in the footsteps of, of Charlie Parker and Dizzy. You know, like I said, uh, after you leave, uh, if you talk about people like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, nobody in the music industry, in my opinion, far, especially in jazz, had the impact or as strong an impact as Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie had on the rest of the musical world mm -hmm. in jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, among pianists that you use currently, uh, Armani Alexander, who's, I wouldn't say he's not just like Peterson, but he's certainly of the same. Well, he has a certain player. amount of, 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 of Peterson influence. Yeah. However, uh, now even all these people I've mentioned, I've never mentioned another gentleman who is my favorite. A lot of people would be shocked by the fact that I place him above all the rest. Okay? That would be Cedar Walton, who's my current pianist when I perform with my own group. Mm -hmm. Okay? But the reason for that is he has all of the aspects and the qualities that I like in a pianist in terms of his approach, his concept, and all. You know, I love him. And a lot of people still don't even know who he is. You know, this is what I'm saying also about going back to what we were talking about in terms of exposure. There's so many great musicians who never get enough exposure so that the people, or the world for that matter, would recognize it and know who he is. I feel it's just vitally necessary that people of that cal caliber or magnitude should be known. Now this is the, and I'm remiss for not bringing it out earlier, this is the band that you have with Ray Brown and, 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 and Mickey, Mickey Roker. Roker. Right. Right, right. These are the musicians I chose as my favorites, in other words. These are the musicians who I feel I would enjoy working with most. Okay? Because this is the idea. I tell you, well, eventually I'm going to get around to trying to put a band together with the musicians who I like most or who I enjoy playing with more so than anyone else. And these are, these are some of the musicians. Now, there are others, but I'm talking about just in, within the confi confines of this quartet. Those are my favorites. We said we're going to create a parallel universe while y'all arguing over here. We're going to create a parallel universe. Stop right there. Dr. King says in his I Have a Dream speech, one day my four little girls will live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Most people believe that I Have a Dream speech, and I spoke about this on the radio yesterday, so I'm not going to go deep into it. But most people believe that I Have a Dream speech was present tense, like you were there you know, and listening to him, and he told you his dream, and it was present tense. No, if you listen to the speech, most of what he said was future tense. 
and the people he was speaking to was us. Hip hop is that vision. Hip hop is that vision. Nowhere else on earth do you see the I have a dream speech actualized but in hip hop, nowhere. Nowhere else on earth. This is the only international culture that really does not operate by way of race. Every other culture and ethnicity on the globe operates internally based on race. Hip hop is the first cult, well I can't say first, there were others, but hip hop is the modern, is, is in, in this modern era, hip hop is the most influential toward the I have a dream goal, most. Now the culture says no. We got some principles to uphold. My grandmother means a little something to me. My father's plight means something to me. I, 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 I don't know about just money. I, you know, let me see what's up with this peace, love, unity. Uh, can we get more knowledge? What about these kids? Uh, now, that's your choice. That's your choice. That don't make you any better than anybody else. It's just that's who you are. And if you're the type to stand on the front lines for people you don't even know for the sake of justice, then that's you. Somebody over here will be like, you crazy. I'm going to get this money. You over here would go ahead and get your money. But I will never live in guilt. I will achieve peace. I have real love in my life. What are you pursuing? If peace and love and joy is not important to you, then keep it real. The problem is, we say we want peace, but we really want that money. Others claim they want money, but really, they just want peace. Culture, cultural corporate. For many years, this was the fight. But I studied directly under Kwame Torre, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, who actually walked with Dr. King, actually influenced Dr. King to use the word black as opposed to Negro. Kwame Torre, head of uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and then later a Black Panther, I studied under him in 19, between the years of 89 and 91. He's passed on since then. But he is the one who coined the phrase black power with the fists up. That's Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torre. He changed his name to Kwame Torre after Seiko Torre and Kwame Nkrumah, African leaders. Here's the point. I always stood on principle, and I always will. The business model of the past always disregarded principles, always disregarded credibility and authenticity for the phony, the fantastic, the unreal, the over the top. Corporate America or Canada, <laughs> corporate Canada is interested in the facade. For many years it's been, let me give you reality as opposed to let's just exploit the reality we're in. Let me create reality as opposed to understand the one we're in. Over the past 10 years, reality has become a major issue on everybody's mind. Reality. I want to get closer and closer and closer to the real. This is a phenomenon. You guys are creating this. This ain't my generation at all. I come out of a generation that wanted the facade. Superman, we ate that up. You guys ain't eating up Superman. This is just, just I don't go quick. Look at the psychology. Spider-Man was a big hit, so but amongst kids. When I was coming up, grown men and women were into Spider-Man. The Hulk was a series on television for adults, not children. It came on at night after work with Bill Bixby, a real dude, turning into a green man. That was adult entertainment in the 70s and 80s. We want the real today. We don't want the facade no more. 
We don't want the fantasy. Tell me what's real. Now you got reality TV. Now the news channels are all trying to give you the most blood and right up to the minute action. How does that affect business? Here's how it affects business. Take KRS-One for instance. You could go on YouTube right now and you'll see me criticizing BET, MTV, VH1, you name it. I don't like nobody's programming at all. However, that voice, yo, why you gotta have all these booties on the TV? Why everybody drunk on the TV? Yo, why you just playing that corny music? Now, that guy is the new business model. Here's how it works. The stock market, market share, banking, rests upon trust. There is no such thing as an economy. That's a word for poor people. What you call a government is really a bunch of people. There's no such thing as law. It's people, how people treat people. These ideas that we have in our mind have to shift. Here's why. I will rail against BET and then they will give me an award for it. Take this in. KRS remains the same person he was before the awards and after. They know exactly where I stand. But the dude is railing. That dude is credible and authentic. And the board members, the bankers, are saying, we don't need the facade no more. There's more money in reality. There's more money in just putting the real out there. Whoever that may be, whatever that may be, is it real? So now, Nike will come to a KRS. And the, power, the old thinking is, Nike is run by all white men with bald heads, stuffy ties, or young preppies who don't understand anything but their credit score. <laughs> this thinking is all. Now, I don't, I'm not a big record seller. KRS is not a big record seller at all. It don't matter today. What matters today is credibility and authenticity because trust is what runs the so-called economy. And things are so bad right now that banks and corporations all over are looking for what's real. So if you've been real and you've been on the front lines for change and you've been that voice for the voiceless, don't give up. You may be at your last leg right now, listening to me right now. You may have came here deciding, I can't do this no more. I'm not getting no support. I'm not getting no help. It seems like I'm beating my head against the wall. Nobody understands what I'm doing. I'm going to quit. I'm going to pursue what I know I need to do. Let me go get a job. Let me support my kids. Let me. No, this, this talk that I'm giving you here today says this. Your time has come. Your time has come. Others won't get it for five more years, but I'm telling you what I'm experiencing right now, and I don't change my principles for no one. The, the companies that grew up with KRS in 87, 88, 89, they are the new executives, CEOs, VPs, and they don't like what's going on either. And their company needs credibility. So all of it works for the guy or for the woman who stay true to their principles. See, this is the new judgment day right here. Everybody chasing the money now not going to get it. Those who said it ain't about the money is going to get it. 
The companies want to hear you say, for me, it ain't about your money. Keep your money. We out here on the corner like this. They will throw that money at you. Please begging you to take their money. I'm not telling you something I've read. I'm telling you something that I'm living right this very moment. One last thing I want to mention is about the creation of wealth. And I'll go real quick with this as a last business model. Remember the first one. The first one can be summed up by saying prejudice will destroy your business life. You already knew that, but now you have articulation for it. Trust is the key. Being able to look past a person's appearance and have a conversation to find out who that person is, is your greatest asset. The young white woman is not ignorant anymore. The young black woman is not disorganized anymore. There are some well-educated people who don't look like they are. And companies are taking advantage while others sit back and go, I'm still going to protest and fight against the system. You already won. Now it's time for you to go collect your spoils. This is the hardest thing for revolutionaries to gather because we've been for so long stuck with our principles and it ain't about the money. It's not. But if it's time for you to reap your harvest, reap your harvest. There's nothing wrong with being rich. Money does buy happiness. Money buys happiness. It doesn't buy joy, but it buys happiness. Happiness is temporary. Joy is everlasting. You cannot purchase joy, but you can purchase happiness. Happiness is your temporary security. You're happy. That's what causes you to be happy. You're secure for a moment. And then you get that happy feeling. But then it goes away. <laughs> and then you got to get back to it. Well, that's the money trail. With 45 albums, I think there's something for everybody with, uh, with Frank's epic music. Well, I think so. But the problem is getting it out to the public because since today, in order to really have exposure on the radio, you do have to pay off. And I refuse to do it. And uh, the other thing that you have to do is play the MTV ball game. And uh, you know, up to a certain point, I'll cooperate with MTV. I'll do interviews for them. And you know, I've been on there before. And, but it's the whole ethic of selling music via picture, where ultimately the picture is the most important thing you're selling. You don't listen to the song anymore. You're looking at the girl's legs getting out of the car, her butt going up and down like that. You know, can you really see your tits through the thing? You know, that's what that uh, has turned into. And it's got nothing to do with the song. You, and after you've watched um, some of those promos, the saturation point comes after maybe six or seven viewings. And um, if you're just listening to a record, you can listen to a record hundreds of times because the appreciation is on a different level. And I'm, my field is music. I like to write music. And that's what I'm interested in. So uh, the audience for what I do is probably shriveling up like a prune, but you know that's tough tuckus. I'm not going to change my tactics in order to uh, to do something else. If you like it, it's there, and if you don't like it, go do something else. You're a legendary workaholic. Are you able to work? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Tell yeah. me. Uh, basically, on, on a good day, I can go 9.30 to 6.30. It's really slowed you down. Yeah. Has being sick affected your music, what kind of music you're writing? No. Well, I don't do vocals. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've been doing? A fair. Fair. Yeah, good days, bad days. More bad days than good days? Yeah. I gather that yours was not caught early. That's right. Is there anything that you want to say to people about prostate cancer? Well, I think that it's worthwhile being examined to find out whether or not you've got it. But then on the other hand, over a period of years, I had urinary problems and was examined, and they didn't find it. And so that's, that's why it came as such a shock to me when they told me that I had it, because I'd had urinary problems for a number of years. And uh, you can imagine how irate a person might be when uh, you are informed that, yeah, you got it, and we can't operate on it. So, uh, yeah, go have a test, but 
Get another test. Get a few tests. Now, I know you're going to say I'm one of these health police people, but... Go ahead. I can't help but sit here and you have cancer and you're smoking cigarettes. Ask, mm. didn't it discourage you at all? No. Why not? <clears throat> because I don't believe that all of the stories about the evil effects of tobacco are true. And I would say, to me, a cigarette is food. Tobacco is my favorite vegetable. And drugs are? It's usually, I say, that the taking of drugs is a license to be an ass, which is the same reason why people drink. Can you if, you, if you had to, or if I asked you to, and if you chose to answer the question, could you sum up Frank Zappa in a few sentences? Which one? Frank Zappa, the... The industrial strength uh, Frank Zappa. The industrial strength Frank Zappa. Uh, I'm a person who uh, likes to do what he wants to do and has worked at it for 20 years and can generally do what he wants to do, whether people like it or not. And what I do is designed for people who like it, not for people who don't. And I have no desire to inflict it on people who don't want to consume it. And I'm committed to turning out as much of it as possible for the people who like it. It's there if you like it. If you don't like it, there's all those other names on the list. What a great attitude. That's neat. Do it's you called rational thinking. <laughs> so few people be, seem to be able to do it. Yeah, I know. It was phased out with the Republican administration. Do you think, do you think the people are, who are entering the music business today are more concerned about being rock and roll stars than musicians? Do you think that's part of the problem? That's, well, that's not part of the problem. That's the way the world really is. Uh, there's very few people who ever went into pop music who did it because they went into it as an art form. They did it because they wanted to be a star. There is a strong desire to be famous, to be rich, to have all the cocaine you want to stick up your nose, have a chainsaw to chop up your hotel room, and naked girls running around with, you know, leather things with points on their wrist and stuff. That's what everybody wants, you know? And they should have that. It's just get it out of my face. <laughs> but they should have as much of it as they want. That's got nothing to do with music. Is there, do you ever think, though, the stuff, the, the electronics and the, and, the, and the microchips can kind of get in the way, though, of the actual true music itself or, or, or what you're really trying to get at? No, actually, it improves it by subtracting the human element, which is the most real unreliable part of doing music. <laughs> if you've ever employed a musician, you know what I mean. <laughs> I thought that was supposed to be part of the uh, creative process, <clears throat> though. Employing musicians? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> uh, you have worked with major symphonies. You've written lots of music. You've looked at the works and studied the works of uh, important modern composers. Is it important to you to be taken seriously in that regard? No. You've done that work, though. When you work with those people, how does it feel to have them respond to you? work with a guy in the, in the tuxedo? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like going to a banquet, except you don't eat. Well, except, isn't it something more than that? I mean, these people are real, these people are real artists. You're talking about people like a Zubin Mehta or somebody like that. That's, that's well, of course, you know, you have to take the people as they come. Individual uh, conductors and performers can be uh, alternately charming or uh, boring. And just because a guy's got a tuxedo on is no sure sign that he's an artist or a fine person. And I've seen both kinds in the orchestral world. Same way in rock and roll, just because a guy's got a nice leather suit doesn't mean he can really rock. Ulysses S. Grant said one of the most unjust wars in the history of the annals of war. Mm. Mexico lost half of its country. That's called gentrification <laughs> on a global scale. Yeah. Just come in grabbing power and land. This is mine. How'd it get to be mine? Because I want it. Hmm. Where'd that come from? Mike doesn't make right. We didn't learn that in where we grew up. That's gangster orientation. You don't say we call it manifest destiny. Hmm. That's American imperialism. That's why America began as an empire. It was a corporation before it was a country. It's always been concerned with resources. It's been those Americans of all colors who had the moral and spiritual maturity and courage to say, we want to create a democratic experiment within the context of this imperial project. But see, most Americans don't even realize they live in an empire. Right. Most Americans didn't even know we bombed nine countries last year. Mm. Four of them in Africa. Five of them in the Middle East. Mm. Most of them don't know we dropped 26,000 bombs. Some of those bombs killed some people. And I come from a tradition I learned in vacation Bible school in Shiloh Baptist Church. Jesus loved the little children, all the children, children of the, of the world, world, black and yellow. Red and yellow, black and white. 
They are precious. In His sight. Y'all learn it in Texas and Bay Area. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but but I as you that. say that though, those children are precious in Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. They precious in Palestine. They precious in Tel Aviv. They precious in Guatemala. They precious in Ethiopia. Across the board. How do we allow ourselves to be used for a larger democratic aim? You can call it human rights, you can call it freedom, you can call it equality, but it's just being a force for good because I'm not in the isms at all. I'm a Christian, so I don't give a <laughs> about worldly isms. You see, if you ain't got no love in it, it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal for me. Right. I don't care how correct your analysis is. If you're not willing to sacrifice something and cut against the grain, then you're just posing and posturing then you're just acting like a peacock. I'm in the eagles. <laughs> I'm not in the foliage. I'm in the fruits. It's not what you seem and what you're wearing. It's what kind of fruit are you bearing? Mm. What kind of effects and consequences are at work? And the people you meet, and the society you live in, and the words you use, and the grin that you leave, and the laugh that you enact, you see. And that is the best of America. It's not just the best of America. It's the best of human spirit but it's the best of America. And we have a tradition of the best in America, like Martin King and others, just like we got a history of tradition of gangsters, like the president. <laughs> it's true. Mm. And both of them are as American as apple pie. <laughs> you see, That's why you just can't talk about getting rid of the president and going back to normal. Right. <sighs> what you think normal, normal? was. Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration, decrepit schools, massive unemployment and underemployment, grotesque wealth inequality, is that your normal? No. Oh, but oh my God, before Trump, America was such a pleasant place. What kind of neighborhood you live in? What kind of moral scope do you have in the neighborhood you live in? You know all the hell people were catching before Trump. Right. Even I know Obama. God bless him. Symbolic indictment of white supremacy. Hey, I broke there for at least one afternoon. But I stopped that evening. <laughs> you know, people mad at you about that. I stopped that evening. I broke there <laughs> three hours straight. Made MC Hammer look like a Boy Scout. <laughs> I was happy because that's an indictment of white supremacy in a symbolic way. Then the question becomes, now what kind of substance are we talking about? Mm. That's the question. Are we going to focus on issues of race? Are we going to have a serious engagement with the new Jim Crow? Are we going to bail out homeowners rather than Wall Street? Are we going to cut back on the national surveillance state? Are we going to cut back on dropping the bombs? Those are the issues of an empire. That's W.B. Du Bois. That's Victoria Garvin. That's Angela Davis. That's Malcolm X. Those are the free ones. None of them have a monopoly on the truth. None of us do as persons. Some of them are Christians like Martin. Some of them are Muslims like Malcolm. Some of them are agnostic like James Baldwin and Audre Lorde. Some of them are, are bisexual like Langston Hughes. Comes in a lot of different forms. But what happened was we lost and we're losing contact with the best of our tradition. And so we're ending up with these weak copies and semblances and simulacra. A simulacra is a copy of a copy. Hmm. You see, so when I was growing up, Ash from the Simpsons, you sing about the real thing. Ain't nothing like the real thing. Have you ever tried it for yourself? Still getting it secondhand from someone else. These days, it's hard to get the real thing. And the young people are hungry for it, and they get a copy and think they got the real thing. Hmm. Hmm. Said, oh, Lord, it's like thinking, lo and behold, I love Beyonce. She's the greatest entertainer. Alive. <laughs> but she ain't no Aretha. <laughs> when she comes to Coachella, she is visionary, courageous. She brings the whole tradition with her. Aretha, Ella, Billy, Carmen. She brought all of them with her. She elevated herself by bringing the whole tradition with her. I salute Beyonce. She understood that she's part of a tradition, but she also knows I'm Queen B. She's the queen. <laughs> Well, and that's not generational. It has to do with the depth of spirituality, a depth of courage that is manifest in the marriage of craft and imagination, manifest in how you touch people's souls. 
She was a soul stirrer. That is the real thing. When you stir people's souls, like Sam Cooke and Johnny Taylor and Lou Rawls. And young folk these days are hungry for that kind of real thing. And it's there, but they don't see it enough. They just don't see it. And if they, if they don't see it enough and begin to imitate the imitation, they're going to lose out on the real substance. Right. And if you lose out on the real substance, then when it's time to be tested, and by being tested, you will be in the fire. Mm-hmm. And that's when you find out who you really are. Right. And you drop, you, you, when you dropped in the fire and recognize you're not really ready, hmm. you're not really prepared, you're either going to pose and posture like you are, or you're going to tell the truth and say, you know what? I'm in over my head. Just like the president. I'm in over my head. <laughs> and this is, and I'm talking especially in the black community here. How do we deal with the discomfort still within the black community sometimes to have those conversations and see people as people, the humanity of folks, yeah. to celebrate that, to move beyond the old school traditions and ways of thinking? But this is where the issue comes back to love again. Comes back to love again. And you see, deep, canotic, self-emptying love never goes out of style. I don't care what generation it is. So if you think that somehow you can love black people but not love James Baldwin (laughs) or not love Luther Vandross because he's gay, you need to check yourself. Oh, you walk into your church and see that brother playing that organ. (laughs) God bless it. And everybody know he's gay as James Baldwin. <laughs> everybody know that. But they're going to sit up there and lie. <laughs> Just lying. Then you got folk in the pulpit. Well, well. In the pew. On the down low. Just be honest. Just be candid. And say, we human beings like everybody else, love comes in a number of different forms. Don't make us better because we love an X and Y. Don't make us worse. We just human. And lo and behold, we need to be accountable like everybody else. Let's bring our resources, our imaginations, our courage together in order to be stronger forces for good. Cross the board. But if you're going to truncate love, if you're going to bottle it up, same is true with patriarchy. Oh, the women can't preach right. in this. In well, the old pit eye in the world, you're going to fight white supremacy with all of its various levels and only got one arm. <laughs> it ain't clear with both arms we're going to win, but at least we can go down swinging with both. And so in that sense, it's a matter of both moral and spiritual quality in terms of what goes into the embrace of those who have different ways in which their love is expressed, but also very practically. We need all the voices. Now, thank God our anthem is Lift Every Voice. Okay. Doesn't just say Lift Every Straight Voice. <laughs> oh, that's not James. That's not James Weldon Johnson. That's not Rosamond Johnson. It's Lift Every Voice. But it doesn't say Lift Every Echo. Mm. Mm. So you don't want no echo chambers. Mm. You can't be a jazz man or a blues woman without finding your voice. If you're just going to be an echo, then go to the choreography. The, the, what is that? What's that club they got there? K- k- karaoke okay. club. Yeah, go, go to the karaoke. <laughs> Just echo what the folk are doing. If you're going to find your own voice like your fingerprint, that's inside of each and every one of us. Mm. And that's how we find our callings, our vocations. An invocation. Grandmama's voice in us. Granddad's afterlife in our life. That's the caravan of love that the Isley Brothers singing about. That's the tradition of love and justice that comes out of a hated people that opens itself to the world. And that's what is leading partly toward the, the staleness of our society. Mm-hmm. Because there once was a time when we actually could go to major black institutions and voices and hear something free mm-hmm. and truthful. Now, it may have the chance of a snowball in hell of being translated because black freedom has always been a taboo in a white supremacist civilization. Mm. But people could raise their voices. They could walk like they free. They could laugh like Richard Pryor. Mm. Free man. They could swing like Muhammad Ali. Free man. They could sing like Ella with swing. Swing ain't nothing but what? Freedom. Stay away from the flatness of the notes. Be on top, on the side, through it, everywhere but on the note. That's called a blue note. That's freedom. 
-hmm. of a people who every day unfree. Jack Johnson, free in the ring. The only space in the whole white supremacist civilization was a ring. That was the only space he could find fairness. He's knocking Vanilla Brothers out. <laughs> and he was viewed as what? A free man who was a major threat. Because when the rules are fair, here come black folk, here come brown folk, here come Asian folk, here come white poor folk. Just set the rules in such a way that they're fair and you'll see your white supremacy and patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia begin to melt. Mm. It begins to just melt. <laughs> Not because anybody's better, but because the rules are fair. But oh, how hard it is to make the rules fair. You see? Right. Somebody right. got to fight, somebody got to live, somebody got to die to do that. Right. Absolutely. But great. And that's what I love about the best of my tradition. Right. We have always had an habitual vision of greatness. That's why the greatest among us was rarely the richest among us. Mm, mm. Nobody knows who the richest Negro in Atlanta was in 1968, but they remember Martin. Mm. Nobody remembers who the richest Negro in Harlem was in 65, but they remember Malcolm. Or the richest Negro in Mississippi, we shall never forget Fanny. Or the richest Negro in Los Angeles, thank God for Angela Davis. Greatness and success don't always overlap. Mm -hmm. And if you are successful and you want to be great, then you better have a quality of service connected with your success. Mm -hmm. That you actually are helping somebody else out. Mm -hmm. Like D Dorothy Irene Height, lifting right. Right. as she climbs. Mm -hmm. That's the best of the Deltas, and the AKA, and the upper middle class black sisters. The beautiful tradition right. at its best, at its worst, idolizing success, ending up peacock. I say that about my alpha brother. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm proud to be an alpha, but Lord, I got some alpha brothers who need some prayer. <laughs> like I do. Like fix it. But we got down in Hathaway and Du Bois and, Mar and Martin King and a whole host of others. And they it manifest greatness as well as success. You see? And the greatness is the key. You, see, you don't have to agree on everything. This is not a military band. This is a jazz orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You got a jazz Yeah, that's right. Gonzalez is blowing a different way. Duke, Duke, what you gonna say? Gonzalez is blowing this way. Johnny Hodges is blowing. Hey, hey, that's what they feeling tonight, you know? <laughs> Isn't that true? Lift heavy voice. That's what Miles told Coltrane, though, didn't he? Miles is your quartet. How come you take three minutes and train takes 19 minutes? Takes him that long to say what he got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Miles is like, you go up the train with train. How come you just kept playing? I just had to get it all out. I didn't know how to stop. Miles said, well, just take the horn out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when it's time, but he, Miles let him do it, though, didn't he? He wouldn't didn't have his ego. I, this is my quintet. I'm going to pay 18 train. You pay three. That's what big folk would do nowadays. And they would get that from where? They'd get it from their agents and their spinsters. Miles. You know, you're not going to get the same kind of contracts if you just allow Train to keep blowing. Next thing you know, it's going to be Train's quartet. Get out of my mouth. Thanks. <laughs> train is my brother. Mm. Taking that long, taking that long. Mm. That's freedom. That's security. He's still himself. Now, he got a problem on the woman question. We know that. <laughs> he kind of like the R. Kelly of his day. In well, I feel level, a little you know bit I mean? like you co He's he wrong as he I'm can be. <laughs> Miles wrong as he can be, but when he starts playing that music through his horn and it touch your soul, then you don't think immediately of Cicely Tyson being attacked. Mm. You still should think about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you don't reduce the genius of his music to the gangsterism of his actions. You remember both of them together because he's a human being who's wrong and he's an artist who can turn your world upside down if you listen closely to Kind of Blue. And that's the kind of re uh, openness as well as accountability I think that we need. People are asking, what do we do nationally but also locally? What does leadership look like? How do we embrace that? But at the same time, when we think about black wealth in terms of who is symbolic of that, 
right? And, and this idea that it's capitalism and that is what is pushing and driving. How do we encourage young people to be more social justice minded right, in this age when Beyonce and Rihanna and Jay-Z are what we look to in terms of financial wealth and well-being for black folks? I know it's a wonderful question. We, we were talking about uh, my dear sister Beyonce before in the way in which, especially with Coachella, you see this shift that's taking place. And Nina Simone's legacy is beginning really to penetrate in a serious way. It's connected to tradition. But you see, in a market-driven culture, though, it's not just about individuals. It's really about how your spirit and character is being shaped. You see, if you really believe that you're going to feel so much better about yourself because you've got a huge mansion, you're living large, and you've got a trophy spouse and so forth, then you need spiritual transformation because it just won't last that long. I mean, everybody fall into it at certain moments because it's a human thing. But you've got to really ask the question, what is the source of your enduring joy, not your ephemeral pleasure? Mm. You see, that's a spiritual question, you see. And all of us fall short. You try again, fight, fail again, fail better. But it's a spiritual question. And so part of the problem with our young people is that their spiritual life has been so truncated mm -hmm. by the market culture. Mm -hmm. And the families are weak. I grew up in the ghetto. It was a community. Donnie Hathaway sang about the love in it. Many of them grew up in the hood. That's not a sight of a lot of overwhelming love. That's survival of the slickest, just like Wall Street. Hmm. So that so many of our young people are not loved enough. They're not cared for it enough. I didn't have to worry about that. You see. So whoever I am, I am who I am because my mama loved me, my daddy loved me, my grandmama loved me, Reverend Cook loved me, Deacon Hinton loved me, Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher loved me. I wasn't worthy of it, but I received it. <laughs> And I'll be true to it until the day I die. Large numbers of young folk of all colors don't receive that. So they're looking for something. And so when you tell them, what do, shall a person profit who gain the whole world hmm. but lose their soul in terms of who they are, how you relate to people, what your reward structure really looks like, is it only measurable in materialistic terms or is it measurable in moral and spiritual and political terms? These are the perennial questions of every generation. We have seen a younger generation who is the most bombarded by a spiritually vacuous, market-driven culture obsessed with things, 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 money, 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 power, power, power. Yeah. That's why I salute so many of them because if I had grown up in circumstances that they grew up. Oh, Lord. I mean, one, I would have been in jail a long time ago. <laughs> and I still may end up in jail. <laughs> it's true. There's nothing but the Holy Ghost holding me together. I may break loose tonight and do something so ungodly. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know. I'm, I'm being honest about this. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's, this, this is a momentary thing. It's day to day. But for our precious young people of all colors, even the well-to-do, I see them in Harvard and Princeton all the time. 800 boards, courts, straight A's, and wondering whether they're still loved or not. Mm -hmm. Does mom and dad really affirm me anyway, even though I got all this money? Why? Because money is never the measure of it. I'll tell you a story about one of the great geniuses of all time. His name is Stephen Sondheim. He's one of my favorites. And he's still alive, God bless him. You all know Stephen Sondheim. West Side Story in his 20s with Lynn Bernstein, company 1970, Sunday in, the, Sunday, in Sunday in the Park with George, that's it, absolutely, and then passion, and oh, magnificent. And I'll never forget, I was interviewing him one time, and, and I said, well, brother, I, I just noticed this pain, this ache, he's a gay brother too, God bless him, and he said, I said, what is it about this blues element that shot through with you? He said, oh, I got a story for you. I was an only child, my mother was a piano player, uh, and, and on Broadway, and she was going to the hospital and was told that there's a 30% chance of her to live, given this triple, bypar the, the, the triple uh, bypass of her heart. And she was given a pen and paper that said, if you need to write anything as a legacy, you might need to write it. And she wrote one line. She said, to Stephen, I have no regrets in life other than giving birth to you. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. 
And I reached over and I gave a hug to my dear brother Sondheim and I said, I've been a black man in America for decades and I ain't never experienced mm. that level mm. of alienation because my mama loved me. Mm. My daddy loved me. Mm. I said, so even though you grow up on the vanilla side of town, Jewish brother, genius to the core, gay brother, he's wrestling with forms of catastrophe I know not of. Mm. Just like I'm wrestling with forms of catastrophe in relation to white supremacy, he knows not of. Yeah, right. But his genius soul person that he is, digging deep inside of his own soul. So when you listen to No More and uh, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the play where, where it, Into the Woods, that's right, where part one is happy, you live happy ever after. In part two, when Cinderella gets to Prince and discovers, is that all you are? <laughs> all this wishing I've been doing. And Sondheim says what? Wishes come, may come true, but never free. Mm. You see, that's coming out of his genius and his experience. That's our human connection. All of our human connections, because catastrophe is on its way to all of our houses in one form or another. Mm. And our young people have to be fortified and equipped. That's why I continually talk about being fortified. That sixth chapter of Ephesians, you got to put on the whole armor, mm -hmm. yeah. put it on. And yeah. even when you put it on, you better make sure you're with the right army. Mm -hmm. And it has to be an army who's not sunshine soldiers, but all season warriors. And even if they're all season warriors, you still might get crushed. Mm -hmm. So what? Go down swinging with a smile, with style. Don't ever allow anybody to steal your joy mm, mm. that you get out of serving others, fighting for others, highlighting others. Because mm. once you have that joy, it's irreducible. Hmm. And once they know they can't smash and suffocate that joy, then you, ooh, this is wonderful. You remember that song by Ashwin Simpson called Send It? Send It. Sing a little bit. Oh, is Sarah here? Sarah, and I think it's ba -ba 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 -ba. You okay. got to just pass on the joy. Sarah, do you know pass that? Pass on the joy. <laughs> send it. That's Astrid and Simpson. Like a puff of smoke. Mm -hmm. You see, just send it. Keep dishing it out. Allow it to flow. Back to the language of Edward F. Adams, 1903, the founding of this institution. He said, we're going to provide a, an attempt to seek the truth in what? Turn it loose into the world. James Brown said, give it up. <laughs> Turn it loose. Send the love. Send the joy. Send the service. Send the connection. Send the grins. Send the laughter. Send the joy, the, the sorrow, and the sadness, too. Send that on. That's who we are. We are the recipients of that sending. Hmm. And the worst thing in America we've ever come up with is this notion of being self-made. Well. Because if you gave birth to yourself. Please stand up and let everybody see. <laughs> let everybody see the level of your self-deception. <laughs> Nobody makes it on their own. Mm. They depended on something bigger than them, depended on those who came before. You work hard, you sacrifice, you're brilliant. If you're like Sondheim or like Coltrane or, or Ella, Ella Baker, Ella Fitzgerald, you're a genius. That's a small slice. Doesn't make them better. They just are who they are, like Tony Morrison. Mm. She's just a genius, and most of us are not. Yeah. That's all right. But no Toni Morrison with her mama, her daddy, her church, Howard University. We can go on and on and on. I know that was a long answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> long answer to that question.